So we're recording the session for uh, the main speakers and then the Q&A will be won't be recorded. So and then the recordings will be available to all registered participants afterwards. And this is the um, researcher led initiative uh, beyond the brick campus building a more inclusive academic structure. So we're trying to find ways that's more inclusive for us distance learners who aren't actually physically at the university through whether that's distance, whether it's through uh, health, whether it's through any other reason that students are unable to attend physically the university, they become distance learners. And how can we enrich that learning process for them? And how can we make that learning process as valuable as possible to move them forward in their understanding and their um, and their learning it's a uh, it's a uh, something that i've been involved with distance learning wise now for the last three years three four years uh through my ma and then through the two years of my phd so far and um i enjoy distance learning and find it's it it's really good once you become aware of how you are a better distance learner and it's uh, that takes time and it's something that we have to build into um, we've also got in the chat we've got links to the padlet that we are uh, running which is a place where we can use to share experience of distance learning uh, i think chris sarah and i have already written into the padlet and it would be useful if anybody else wanted to introduce themselves in the chat or uh, and then say something in the Padlet about their experience of distance learning. Uh, this morning, we've got uh, a session from the Exeter Doctoral College's Researcher Development and PGR Welfare Teams. We have uh, Kelly Priest and Catherine Baker who are joining us this morning to do a presentation and then take any questions and discussion points, if that's OK with them. Uh, based around this. Now, uh, I think Kelly's going to start. And um, Kelly is the Research and Development Manager and Research and EDI Manager at the University and has a background as an academic, worked as a distance lecturer and scholar for six years before moving into research development and training. Kelly has a track record of pedagogical research and expertise in training and development and online blended learning, having been awarded her postgraduate certificate in learning and teaching in higher education in 2014 and her senior fellowship of the Higher Education Academy in 2019. She continues to publish her pedagogical research with a commitment to publishing in online open access journals. Wow, that's, uh, that's quite a... That's quite a, a, a bio, isn't it, to actually get us going this morning? As Ben said, my name's Kelly Priest. I um, have been the research and development manager for PGRs in the Doctoral College for almost seven years now. And I'm currently um, working part time in research development and I am on secondment part time in the wider research services looking at research and EDI. So I've kind of I like to give things a title to give me a sense of where I'm going. So I've called it my presentation digital first hybrid and the new accessible normal so the kind of the background for me talking about distance learning and online learning in particular is that over my career in academia so i've been um an academic and in professional services for about 13 years now um i have become an expert in online and blended learning um I do quite a bit of pedagogical research, so my approach to teaching is that teaching should always be a critical reflective practice and therefore um, involve the production of new knowledge. And I make a commitment to share that in a variety of fora, including conferences and publications. But specifically, my work on online and blended learning was the basis of my postgraduate certificate in learning and teaching in HE. It was the basis of my senior fellowship application, which I was awarded. And it is the basis of my National Teaching Fellowship application, which was approved by the university and is currently with Advance HE. I may find out in July um, <laughs> if I was successful in that one. It sounds an awful lot like I'm blowing my own trumpet, and I guess I am, and I don't think we do that enough, but part of it is to say I am well positioned to talk about this stuff. I have quite a lot of experience in it. Um, and in fact, 
you may have seen. So one of the things that's on this slide is um, an article I recently wrote for One KG, which is a kind of national um, policy organisation think tank for higher education about blended and remote programmes, um, particularly in relation to accessibility and disabled students in response to this Disabled Students Commission report about the gains that had been made for disabled students through blended and remote learning during COVID. On the right hand side is a poster I developed for a conference um, a couple of years ago um, about developing a pedagogy for online training and development. So as some of you here will know, the research and development programme for PGRs has had a webinar component to it since long before I started at the university and that was in August 2015. It was very small and I'll talk about that in a moment. But we have been delivering online for some time. Therefore, when all of our colleagues were kind of rushing to figure out how you even deliver online, we were having more critical discussions within our team, not just about how the hell you deliver using different technologies, but how you not just how do you deliver, but what you deliver and why. So some of the more pedagogical concerns. And so at a conference in 2020, whilst some of my colleagues in the sector were presenting sort of <laughs> reflections on the challenges they faced moving their programmes online, um, I presented um, a proposed pedagogy for online training and development specifically that combines live events, static resources and social media and the use and the, the combination of these things moving um, us towards community building. So this model is actually, I first proposed, we took a digital first approach to research development and training and development at the University of Exeter in 2016. So at the end of my first year in post, I proposed a flip learning model. So we do the majority of the delivery online um, and we use uh, any face-to-face -face activity to do it's kind of supplementary activity. And there was interest from the powers that be, they liked the idea of it especially given that it had quite a strong pedagogical basis, but there was a hesitancy, hesitancy about moving things online, particularly about what would be lost. So this perception of the idea, if you, if you deliver something online rather than face to face, you're losing something ephemeral, um, but also a concern that engagement would decrease if we weren't delivering face to face. So what I did was I worked on expanding the existing research development webinar programme as the foundation for a digital first training and development model in the hopes that if I could show the impact of what we would of potential impact of delivering online, everyone would follow. So this is a poster that I made many years ago now about the research development webinar programme. I was absolutely mortified to walk past it when I went back onto campus after COVID because it feels incredibly naive and out of date, <laughs> but it demonstrates how far we've come in online delivery um, since COVID. So when I took over the webinar program for research development in 2015, just checking my facts here, we had eight webinars that we ran each academic year. I've worked since to train and upskill all of our facilitators, both internal colleagues and external consultants to adapt and deliver their workshops online. This has meant year by year a gradual expansion of the webinar programme, ensuring that it mirrored our face to face provision. And by 2019, everything that we delivered face to face, we also delivered an online equivalent to. The goal of this was to provide a coherent training and development programme for you, our distance students as well as providing an accessible option for those with fluctuating health or long-term health conditions. However, we found that these innovations also transformed the learning experience of our campus-based students. In feedback on our webinars, campus-based students noted that they liked the convenience of doing it from the home or from, or from the lab and office. And they also liked the bite size, as they called it, nature of the training, the fact that it was only an hour rather than two or three. You can see from these figures, that the concerns about um, a decrease in engagement were unfounded. The first set of figures is the number of webinars we've run per academic year. You see that we were running eight before I joined the university. We increased this um, to 19 in my first year in post. And this year we've run 116. 
So a significant increase, but that increase has also seen an, an increase in engagement. So we had 290 people engage with our online um, delivery in 2014 and 2015. And last year we had 2,604. Obviously we need to take COVID into account with this, um, particularly with 20, from 2019, 2020 onwards. Um, and that that's why we've seen such a jump from the 2018, 2019 delivery. But you'll see we were still all, at almost a thousand engagements in 2018, 2019, so before. COVID hit. Well, there was a quote from one of our distance learning students. Um, he says, as a distance learning part-time student who was living and working overseas, I can honestly say the expansion of the offer from research development to, to the use of webinars was instrumental in the increased level of support provided to those students who were hard to reach. The use of the webinars provided me with the opportunity to feel connected to a PGR community and that I was not alone. And that sense of connection and community building, if we can just go back to this model, is really key for me because, of course, it's about training and development. Of course, it's about that. But my ethos and my approach to training and development has always been that actually the best learning you do is the learning that you share with each other. It's not necessarily me telling you how to write a literature review or how to use EndNote or how to prepare for your Viber. Those things are useful, which is why we do them. But actually we know from research that the deep learning in professional context and in training and development context happens when you're engaging with your peers, when it's informal. One of the things that we've been able to do post COVID is to expand our online offer. So we historically had some online courses, some static online materials on our early page, um, which were completed in 2010. So the time I joined the university, they were quite out of date already. Um, and partly because they were built in a software, a piece of software called Articulate that you couldn't edit. So by the time I joined five years later, all of the links were completely dead that were embedded into all of the courses and there was no way to update them. I proposed back in 2016 that we employ an individual or multiple individuals to break down these resources into smaller components so that we're able to create more bite-sized resources and still make use of the content we had because the content in and of itself was quite helpful it's just the way that it was packaged was not both in terms of the software that was used but also they were like hour two hour long courses you had to work through um, which we know is not how people engage online so fast forward to 2020 um, and I got awarded some money um, from the university to redevelop our resources um, and to in fact employ PGRs to work with me on the redevelopment of those resources. And that's a really important part of it for me. Um, and I keep joking to everybody, it only took a global pandemic um, <laughs> for them to give me the money to do a thing that we knew was a good idea long before 2016. The list that you've got on the left hand side is all of the resource topics that we've got. So each of these topics has multiple subsections and, and different types of resources within them. Those in italics are currently in development. So you'll see it covers quite a wide range of content already. As I said, each topic is broken down and you can see on the right hand side the different sections in the planning your development resource, for example and have diff different multimedia content within each of those sections. And the idea of the way that they're built is that you could work through it like a course if you wanted to, but you could also go to the section and the content that is most relevant to you. So if you're working on your literature review, if the thing that you're interested in is note taking, you could go straight to that section. You don't need to work through everything else to find, to find the content that's useful for you. We originally built all of these resources on Ellie and alongside it, we also built a career planning guide for PGRs. Um, we are in the process of finishing moving these off Ellie onto open access websites. So the PGR career planning guide is already live as an open access website at pgrcareerplanning.co.uk. And by the end of the summer, we should have completed the move to researcher-development.co.uk 
Part of the ethos of this is to make sure these resources are open access. So they're available to researchers across the UK. I don't believe in hiding things behind a paywall if we don't need to. There's nothing about any of this content that is privileged, um, that has any GDPR concerns or any of those things. So why would we not make it available? And I find a WordPress website is much a nicer interface than Ellie personally. Um, <laughs> But as I said, one of the part of the thing that we've done with this is that we have employed PGRs to work on this with us. And that ethos of by PGRs for PGRs is really important. And those of you that might have attended the webinar program will know that several of our webinars are delivered by our PGRs. This is to enhance that community building, peer learning and informal learning that I talked about. And the reality is. What your peers say to you has much more currency than what I said to you. It's been a long time since I was a student. Um, I know what I'm talking about, for sure. But if I tell you how to prepare for your Viva and an ECR who's just graduated tells you how to prepare for your Viva, the likelihood you're going to list is you're going to listen to them more than you are to me, as well you should. So why do we not make the most of the resource and the expertise we have in our community? and pay them to do it. Ooh. So alongside the delivery webinars, the static online resources, we also have a really active shut up and write group. So this is a team on Microsoft Teams. It started life as a uh, supporting PGR writing project that we got funding for from the annual fund and has evolved multiple times the last kind of major evolution being at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and it's now a completely online workspace for PGRs. It runs all day every day, some sessions are facilitated, some are not and the facilitated sessions use the Pomodoro technique where you work for 25 minutes and take a break for five minutes to work on writing or to be honest anything else to do with doing a research degree. The Shut Up and Write has become one of the most successful things we have ever done in research development. I think that's fair to say. Catherine can confirm that or not. Um, and the reason that it's so successful is that we involve students from the start and it has now been com completely taken over by the PGRs. I have next to nothing to do with it anymore. And that was always the goal, that it becomes a community PGR-led space. You'll see the increase in engagement from 2017, 2018, when the project started to 2018, 2019, we had an increase in engagement of 504%. And then when we went into COVID-19, the next year we had an increase in 890%. I can't remember what the figures are for this year, but we're, we're well over 3,700 attendances this academic year so far. So we, we, will, we will top that once again. Now, the powers that be above me love it because they love these numbers because they look fantastic and they look extraordinary. I love it because I see all of the tweets, all of the chats on Teams that show what an integral supportive community this is. These are people that are constantly there for each other. And it's been particularly important for those at distance, those who have been shielding because they're extremely vulnerable, but international students who were stuck in Exeter completely on their own during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the reality is the online format of it works. It's really flexible. And flexibility is something that we all need. And we've, we've learned that in our work lives during the pandemic. On top of that, um, like I said, because we were already delivering online during COVID, we've also been able to take on some new stuff because we haven't had the upskilling that perhaps our colleagues um, across the university have needed to undertake. So we've launched two podcasts. There's researchers development and the in-betweens. So this is a kind of a generic catch-all podcast as perhaps is implied by the title, um, which is basically talking to researchers about their experience of doing research. And the idea behind the podcast was to try to recreate those kind of informal conversations that you might have with each other, bumping each into each other in a coffee shop on campus or in the hall or in an, or in an office. So there's a whole kind of range of conversations where we know peer learning takes place that 
we lost during COVID. So the idea between of our D and the in-between as a podcast was to try to recreate some of that by getting researchers to talk about their experience and share their stories. The second podcast is Beyond Your Research Degree. This is very careers focused. So it's interviewing our um, doctoral graduates about what they've gone on to do since they completed their research degree. And it's specifically focused um, on roles beyond academia. Although during COVID, we did interview a couple of people who started academic posts during COVID just to kind of unpick some of the anxieties and concerns about that. But alongside the podcast, we've also got our blog, we've got our Twitter account. We try and keep very active on social media to be part of the conversation, but also to ignite and facilitate conversation. So that's kind of where we are and what we're doing right now. But I am not a believer that anything is ever perfect or anything is ever finished. <laughs> Catherine could probably <laughs> um, attest to that. I don't stand still for very long or sit still in most instances. So one of the things that we've been campaigning for for a long time is to increase the learning technology in old library rooms four and five, which are the training rooms that we have access to. Um, they've not even had recap, so um, like lecture capture software um, before, they still don't. But um, as part of the upgrading of teaching rooms throughout the university, we not only bid to get those rooms upgraded to have basic recap video conferencing facilities, but also to become one of the university's flagship enhanced hybrid rooms. So the kind of tech we're talking about in this room is you name it, it's got it. Multiple cameras, multiple microphones. We're able to live stream what's happening in the room, focus on the presenter, the PowerPoint, on flip chart paper on a table, it's got lots of flexibility. And what this is going to mean is that not only are we committed to digital first moving forward, so we've always said this post COVID, now that we've got the evidence that digital works, we will be a digital first programme. So we will deliver content online before anything else. And our main programme will be our online programme. But if we deliver anything in person, it will not purely be face to face, it will be hybrid. So my goal is once we have the tech in place and once we've trained everybody up, that we will no longer deliver any event that is purely face-to-face. -face. Every event we, be, we deliver will be hybrid. There are lots of reasons for this. Obviously access and accessibility for distance students is a really, really big part of that. Um, the importance of integrating our campus and distance based students is really, really important. We've seen the benefits of that during COVID, particularly with Shut Up and Write. But also we want to kind of take a stand as an example of what, what learning in higher education should be. That it should be hybrid, it should be flexible, it should be accessible. And with the level of tech we're gonna have in this room, you will be able to have discussions amongst people that are both in the room and online. So it won't be two separate things. It will be very much integrated because the kind of, the kind of technology we'll be using. So that's kind of my vision <laughs> for where we're going. Um, and the work is being done in the old library um, from June. So it's happening, um, which is really exciting. Um, so that's my kind of overview. Thank you very much for listening to me talk. I don't know if we're going to do questions to me now or you're going to go to Catherine and do questions afterwards, but anything works for me. Catherine is the Education Welfare Advisor for PGR students. She works in the welfare team, which is part of wellbeing. The focus of her role is to provide guidance, advice and signposting on a wide range of issues relating to your welfare, health, personal problems, support for study plans, and options for academic progression. So two very well qualified people to discuss and to talk about the uh, university's doctoral college welfare process. I'm just gonna give you a sort of a whistle stop whistle store of what's available to you that you can that you can access remotely 
Um, I'm talking very generally, um, so service names, etc., do change depending on whether you're at Penryn or at St Luke's, but generally the support mirrors um, across the campuses. So as from the introduction, as you heard, um, I'm not part of the Doctoral College. Um, I sit within the welfare team, which is under the larger umbrella of wellbeing. However, my remit is only to work with the PGR community across all four of our campuses. Um, so uh, so that there's a, a, there is a main link. And my role came into post um, just coming up for two and a half years now. So it was January um, 2019, so just before we hit the we hit the pandemic. So like Kelly, a uh, brand new role that was only face to face face only face to face service provision um, had to go completely on, online. So when we think of student welfare well being, um, it includes a couple of a couple of different things. So we're looking at a student's mental health, a student's physical health, but also their academic health as well. Um, and the aim is by having a balance of all three of these things, um, it makes you as a researcher much more proactive um, and engaged with your with your with your studies um, and within your community. So one thing to point out is depending on where you are based, it can impact what support is available to you. So if you're based overseas, um, it's very difficult for a service to be able to provide therapeutic support. Um, and that's to do with licensing and all sorts of things. However, if you're in the UK, um, there's generally a similar support service that you can be referred to. So just to put that out there, that um, you know, there are limitations um, that are beyond the control of the wellbeing practitioners um, and what they can do. So I'm going to now provide you with a bit of an overview of what support is available within our institution um, and just to point out that the university works very closely with external services as well so sometimes a student may initially start off accessing well-being however they may then end up having their support provided by someone externally and that's just and that's just because waiting lists um, to access support sometimes it can be accessed externally much quicker um, or the breadth of support can be greater via an external service so just to touch on some academic support, as you've already heard from Kelly, there is a wealth of support out there to do with your academic studies. Um, and I know that some of them touch on with, with welfare and well-being as well. Um, so really encourage you to go and look at that catalogue. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, but in addition to that, some of these you know, your supervisor is there to support you predominantly with academic guidance. Um, but often, you know, conversations can lead to other things. Your pastoral tutor is part of your team, who is someone that you're able to talk to about any welfare concerns, but also academic concerns, and your conversation with them should be confidential. Um, so, you know, they are a really good source of support, particularly if there's sort of conflict around supervision. Sometimes, you know, they can be a good place to start because they're supervisors themselves and may have encountered something, something similar. Study skills advisors, so there's a designated team um, who, again, offer one-to-one -one support for PGR students. You self-refer, book them yourself. Some of the things that they offer is time management, which is something that we have come across a lot within the PGR community around time management, note making, proofreading, um, uh, academic writing, a whole range of things. So that again, it's a free of charge support service. Doesn't matter where you're based, um, and you can access and you can access that. If you're international, there is an Intu team um, offering support for English language, and some colleges, such as the Business School, have their own bespoke program um, attached to that. And then thinking about um, any. Uh, disability or illness, there is the accessibility team as well, and they come under the umbrella of wellbeing, um, and their remit is very much to provide you with information and advice on anything related to any disability um, or any learning disability, any long-term illness, um, and they can discuss with you about support that's available, but also can help write something called an individual learning plan or an ILP that looks about any reasonable adjustments 
that um, could be in place for your studies or more, more importantly for your viva um, and it puts a, it acknowledges them and puts the responsibility within your supervisory team to try and accommodate them as much as possible and again that's a team that you can self-refer into there's no oh I need to speak to someone and I have to have um, you know the nod or the go ahead from them you can just and if you're unsure what the team offer they offer um, a, a quick session where you can have a quick 10 15 minute chat with some, with one of the advisors and they'll be able to tell you um, whether it'd be worthwhile to have a more in-depth conversation um, and what support they can so that's just a touch of what academic support which again is all is all heavily related to your overall welfare within your studies link in now your personal health so your your well-being and your and your welfare there's a lot of support that's available. I suppose the two differences is whether you look at more self-guided support and there is lots and lots of resources on the university website. There's things such as Silver Cloud, which is a self-guided cognitive behavior therapy um, sessions that you can go through. There's, um, web, there's uh, different links to um, uh, things to download onto your phone lots and lots of things covering all sorts of different all, all sorts of different issues the other type of support of course is practitioner led support whether that's through a counselor or more of a therapeutic practitioner and here within the university it's our well-being team that offer this type of support accessing support again you can self-refer to this it doesn't need someone to refer on your behalf but the way you access the support and start the conversation of what type of support is available you can start with me um, or if you know directly you want to go to well-being you can book a 20-minute appointment and that can be for those of you that are extra based it can be in person or it can be online and that's very that would be with a practitioner looking at um what's happening, what's your circumstances at that particular time, looking to see what support may be available and that you and that you can access. And there is urgent support as well. So if you want to speak to someone, the crisis happens on a particular day you can contact the wellbeing team and they will try and get a practitioner to speak with you that particular day. But they sort of are looking at referring you into counselling. The most common type of therapeutic support is CBT or cognitive behaviour therapy um, or any other things that might be of help to you. There's also the um, wellbeing team also look at, they also put on webinars and sessions um, online. Predominantly, they are across the UG, PGT and PGR community. However, more recently, they have been looking at developing more bespoke sessions for the PGR community. So just running its second session now, there's a four week program looking at people's well-being alongside their alongside their studies. So healthy studies, healthy, healthy person. Um, and that's looking at a whole range of different things. You can sign up for all four or you can just sign up for one. Um, and coming up over the summer is a compassionate course just for PGR students. So it is so it's looking very much about how to manage your well-being alongside your studies. Um, and there's, there's hopefully that we'll start to see more things come in online as more requests come in. External support. So this is support that someone in the wellbeing team or myself may suggest to you, signpost you to, or you may access them yourself. Um, and uh, that can be through your local area, your GP, etc. Or otherwise, as a PGR student, you can access counselling um, via the provision called Spectrum Life. So this is the service the university are linked up with, um, and it's for staff and PGR students. And you can self-refer for a one-off conversation with a qualified counsellor or set yourself up with a course of sessions with a counsellor. And that doesn't matter where you're based in the world. So that's very useful if you are an international student, uh, finding it difficult to access support in your area, you can access. There's a bespoke um, username and password for the university, which we can give you. The university is also very aware, very well aware of just the cultural, you know, 
differences that there are across our PGR community. We're a very diverse community. Um, and at times, you know, sometimes that can make a difference to what type of support a student may wish to access. So the university linked up with a provision in Bristol called Nalari. Um, and this is an external support and they very much specialize in support and counseling for black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. You can self-refer or again um, myself or someone in the team can, but that's whereby you can link up with someone who perhaps um, you feel more comfortable to work with. I'm not sure if they can offer support if you are based internationally. Um, I, I, would have to double, I would have to double check that. If there is a crisis um, and something that needs uh, dealing with straight away, we do have a welfare consultant team um, who are based here on the Streatham campus, um, but uh, they are people that you can talk to up until 11 o'clock in the evening. Um, they can signpost to support or if you are very much in the local area can come and help and can come, can come and help you. So that's just to give you a flavour of what's available within, within the university, within the wellbeing um, and uh, team and the teams within that. Outside of that, I want to remind you about the multi-faith chaplaincy team. It's a team that can easily be overlooked, but they are a fantastic support service to you as a PGR student. And they can provide you, it doesn't, you don't have to be of a particular religion. Um, but they offer you um, a safe space to be able to talk um, about something in a confidential and non-judgmental manner. Um, so again, a really good source of support that you can reach out and access. Um, and as, just to finish off, uh, there's my role as well. And as uh, Ben said at the beginning, um, my role can just be you don't know where to go. You don't know what your options are. Um, so it may be that you want to speak to someone who's not part of the doctoral college, who's not part of your academic team, um, but have a confidential meeting and be able to talk through some of those things that may be happening to you at that time. And you're just wanting to know what provision is out there, what options do, do I have? Um, and then, you know, that can give you the time then. And contact with myself can be a one-off conversation, or it may be, I've been seeing students every month since the pandemic started. Um, it's for as long as a student requires, and it doesn't matter um, where, where you're based. I don't have slides today, but if anyone, if it is helpful for afterwards, I'm happy to put a crib sheet together. However, the Doctoral College website um, is a really good starting point for, for you being able to navigate through to the relevant areas within wellbeing or any of the things that are related to your academic studies. Um, so I think that hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavour, a uh, bit of an overview of what you can access um, and I'm happy for anyone to reach out um, or to um, take any questions. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was really, really interesting. I didn't know there was such a wide array of help actually out there um, connected to the university and beyond the university that uh, that we could access. Uh, that's staggering. Uh, but a useful list, the list of useful contacts and websites would be absolutely brilliant to uh, that we could we could have and share amongst us. That would be super. Uh, thank you so much for what you've what you've done this morning. That's excellent. Um, thank you for inviting. It's, it's always a good time. opportunity to be able to um, talk to our community and get some feedback ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely, lovely, brilliant. Okay, well, we'll take our our lunch break there. Hello and welcome back, everybody, to this second half of the 6th of June meeting, where we're beginning to think about uh, neurodiverse students and the access they have to learning and to distance learners. Um, and our first speaker this afternoon is Peter Shepherd, who has been, uh, he's been my mental health counselor and uh, somebody who's been of huge support to me in the last three years of my journey with um, distance learning all the way through my MA and now through the PhD. And he works with um, the challenges and mentoring distance learners who have got the challenge of mental health conditions and uh, is a counsellor and has worked in, in this field for a long time, has uh, committed his life to the maxim, know yourself. 
and he is a therapeutic counsellor, specialist mentor, life coach and storyteller, recognising self-discovery is integral to the learning experience. Pete's motivation comes from his passion for every individual to discover and inhabit their true selves and to celebrate who they find there. And that's a that's something that I've been doing over the last three and a half years and uh, still still exploring. So if Pete is ready, then I'll pass over to pass over to Pete. Thank you, Ben. That was a, a, a lovely introduction. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, it's really good to be with you. I hope you found this morning helpful and beneficial and you've had uh, a great long lunch. It's never really a good thing to uh, be the person who picks up after a long lunch, but hopefully that um, what I share will be of interest to you as uh, we engage together in thinking about how through distance learning we can support and encourage um, those who have issues particularly with neurodiversity. Um, so I want to kind of do three things if that's okay this afternoon. I want to, to explore um, the big three challenges to distance learning that many who are neurodiverse um, experience, particularly those things which are detrimental to their mental and emotional health. And then secondly, I'd like to, um, to bring into the room a metaphor um, which will help us in kind of grounding um, where support can um, be of use, enabling someone to go from surviving to thriving. And then we will finish up with how to develop a thrive culture in our learning. I don't know how that sits with everybody on this uh, Monday afternoon. Sounds perfect. Right. Okie dokie. Well, um, let's, let's think then, shall we, about those big three challenges that um, are often experienced by those who uh, are involved in distance learning. So when we're thinking of distance learning, we're thinking of people who live quite a way away from campus, um, learners who um, cannot uh, drop in to um, campus and to avail themselves of all that the campus life has on offer, and those perhaps whose uh, mental and emotional health means that they have perhaps some added complications or issues which make distance learning that much more difficult. So. I want to kind of uh, bring into the room three main um, challenges, the big three really, that really get in the way of um, the learning experience. The first one I think we could broadly say is around isolation, the difficulty uh, of isolation. I'm sure we've all found uh, ourselves thinking or sometimes saying, I feel stranded or I feel on my own. Um, those um, words can often be indicative of that sense of feeling completely isolated, a bit like Robinson Crusoe, marooned on a desert island, not knowing where to turn, not knowing where to go. That sense of feeling completely adrift and not part of something, not part of anything at all. So that isolation can be quite um, overpowering, it can be quite overwhelming at times. That's one of the issues that, that, that many face, particularly those um, who are neurodiverse. Alongside that, and part of that, of course, is the second big issue, which is disconnection. And that sense of disconnection um, is often felt in three key ways. There's a geographical disconnection where you can't access the facilities on, uh, on campus. It can often be uh, difficult when you are a distance learner when you uh, are on the same email trail as every other learner and you receive those emails that tell you about events or workshops that are going on in the library or resources that you can have from the library. Those sorts of emails really reinforce that sense of disconnection because the accessibility of the campus isn't there. Uh, it may be um, 100 miles away or more. And so the ability to get there may be really, really impacted by the physicality of, of where you are. So geographical disconnection is a massive, massive part of that isolation. Another part of that disconnection is the academic uh, disconnection, where uh, learners who distance learn can't always access the supports that they need around their academic learning. So for example, um, if a distance learner um, struggles uh, with um, the way in which learning is presented, 
um, they perhaps won't have the dyslexic support that they might get if they were on campus. And the other uh, aspects of support that would be there for them on campus, they just can't access because they're not there. And of course, this has a huge part to play on the academic learning experience. And the third part of that disconnection, I guess, would be the emotional support. One of the, 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 the things that we often find when, when I, I certainly found when I've worked on campus uh, mentoring learners is that they're part of networks, um, academic networks, social networks, networks where they could physically face to face hang out with each other, either at the student union or in one of the student cafes or around the town or city where their university is based. That sense of emotional connection, that sense of, of being with fellow travellers, fellow adventurers um, is really valuable and really needed, particularly in the spurring of each other on when study gets difficult. So without that, that kind of emotional support, there can be a real disconnection uh, when you're on your own. That's not to mean that things like we're doing today aren't helpful, they are incredibly helpful, but that face-to-face -face, um, interaction um, is really, really supportive. And the last of the big three that I want to mention with regards to um, challenges which can be detrimental to emotional and mental health is the one of introspection, that sense of internalising our thoughts and our fe feelings. Um, often in the work that I do uh, around mentoring, uh, I, I, I bring into the room the story that we tell about ourselves. We all tell a story about ourselves. That story will sometimes be positive. That story will sometimes be negative. A story may sometimes be neutral, but it's a story we tell about ourselves. When we engage with others, other people help shape the story we tell of ourselves. But when we're on our own, we can so internalise our story that our story just is it's just made up, really, of our thoughts and our feelings. More often than not, our internal story can become negative. I wonder how many of us have ever experienced the imposter syndrome. Uh, that condition where we wake up one day and we ask ourselves the question, I'm a fraud. When are they going to realise? When are they going to find me out? When are they going to um, acknowledge that, that I'm, I'm punching above my weight in the studies that I'm doing? That imposter syndrome is, is very compelling. When that really gets into our, our story, the one we tell of ourselves, it's very, very difficult to shake. It's very difficult to, to let go of. And so those big three challenges, the challenge of isolation, the challenge of disconnection and the challenge of introspection, they're made much more uh, real and much harder through distance learning. And if we overlay that with um, a neurodiversity, then we recognise that those things are accentuated quite, quite a bit. And so the learning journey can be greatly impacted. It can be impacted in as much as it becomes difficult, it becomes a challenge, and sometimes it can be to the point where uh, learners decide, actually, it, where I am in my life at the moment, this is a journey too far. This is um, a journey that I can no longer make, and so they, they, um, they stand down. Those three challenges, the big three challenges, as I call them, are there, therefore we need to, to address them. And it's, it's in the addressing of them that I'd like to just introduce um, a metaphor. Uh, and Ben will be very familiar uh, with this metaphor that I'm going to use. It's the metaphor of, of climbing Everest. And as you can see, I brought you all to the foot of Everest with my backdrop this afternoon. Um, Everest is an imposing structure. Everest provides a climb which only the very best, the very uh, committed, most committed can ever, ever make. But it's a journey which uh, is, is exhilarating. You have to be an adventurer to be uh, a mountaineer. But you also need to be an, an adventurer to be a learner, to be a student. And so I gather this afternoon with you guys, you are all adventurers in your own field of study. But any mountaineer, mountaineer worth their salt would tell you that if you're climbing Everest, you cannot climb Everest alone. You need a Sherpa to climb with you. 
Sherpas uh, are fascinating. They come from a group of people in Tibet who are so acclimatized to their region, their experience, they have an expertise and they have a passion for the place that they live and inhabit, that they become indispensable to mountaineers. They are indispensable as guides, they're indispensable as mentors, and they're indispensable as teachers of truth. So if we think about the climb of Everest, we break it down into those three parts. Let's first look at the pre-climb, the ground to base camp. Sherpas come into their own in that phase of the climb because Sherpas are familiar with the route. They know the route, they know it by the back of their hand, they're familiar with it, they know its twists, they know its turns, they know what it's going to offer, they know the challenges it's going to bring up. But the Sherpas are also aware of the conditions, they know of the terrain, they know of the weather, they know of those things to be particularly mindful of that might catch you out. Sherpas also have a wide ranging knowledge of the challenges that lie ahead, of the moments in the climb to base camp when the air starts to get a little thinner, when the journey becomes a bit steeper. And Sherpas are also good in informing that relationship between himself, herself and the mountaineer that will get the very best out of the mountaineer. So in that pre-climb from ground to base camp, the Sherpa comes into its own in forging the relationship that's going to enable the, the mountaineer to learn best. Well, the second part of the climb of Everest is from base camp to the summit. And that's made up of various stages, but that's where the climb really takes off. And on this particular part of the climb, the Sherpa within the relationship he or she has with the uh, mountaineer is always encouraging movement. It's always encouraging when the going gets tough, when there are crevasses, when there are obstructions, when it feels like the journey might come to an, an abrupt end. The Sherpa just encourages, motivates, inspires, creates opportunities for the mountaineer to dig deep and to continue with the climb by putting one foot in front of the other foot. And of course, the Sherpa not only encourages movement, the Sherpa always, also through relationships sustains that momentum. And often the Sherpa will sustain momentum with the mountaineer by challenging and encouraging the mountaineer to reappraise the beliefs they hold about themselves. Because climbers who climb Everest will often tell you that part way up, their beliefs in self really come into question. Those beliefs that got them there in the first place, I can do this, I have experience, I have expertise, I have the wherewithal, I can do this. As hard as it comes, I will complete the, the course. Well, those challenges uh, uh, that the mountain throws up can cause the mountaineer part way up to really challenge the beliefs they hold about themselves and about their climb. And so the, the Sherpa, she or he allows the uh, mountaineer to really bring those, those beliefs into front and center, to deconstruct them, to reconstruct them in a way which supports the climb. So momentum's not lost, but momentum continues. And of course, through reflective practice, that relationship of talking, of learning, of growing, the mountaineer is able to reflect on what they're learning thus far, each and every day of the climb, and what they're learning about themselves within the climb. That reflective practice and that application of the learning found from it is key to the Sherpa mountaineer relationship. And of course, post climb, when they're on the top, we're on the summit, it's the Sherpa that takes a back seat and says to the mountaineer, hey, take that view in. Look at the panorama that's in front of you. As you stand on the roof of the world, what do you see? What do you sense? What do you feel from this achievement? And so within the Sherpa mountaineer relationship, the Sherpa is encouraging the mountaineer to celebrate their achievement 
to take a look back and look at the twists and the turns, to look at where they've been, to look at where the past stretches out into the far distance and to remark and remember the twists and the turns, the moments where there was great peril and the moments of great joy and achievement. To remember the climb with satisfaction, with celebration. And of course, within the Sherpa mountaineer relationship, the Sherpa will always encourage the mountaineer to celebrate the with a reward. How will you reward the climb? How you will reward yourself from this moment? How will you mark it? How will you mark this as something significant, as something special, as something which is beyond achievement? and allows you to know that you have done something that perhaps not many other people have done themselves. I use that metaphor of, of climbing Everest because it has such a lot to say about the learning relationship between those who support learners and the learners and their relationship to their study. For Sherpas uh, or mentors, as we call them in, in um, education, in the educational setting of those that, that do those three things. That in the beginnings of, um, of MAs and PhDs can be there to enable the, the learner to really become familiar with the route map that they have, to bring questions to, 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 to bear, to bring those things that they need to bring to mind in order to begin to make that journey. Then that mentoring learning relationship those things can come out and into the fore where the mentor could be a support, um, helping the learner, particularly if they are neurodiverse, with the specifics that they need in order to traverse the highs and the lows of the, of the learning experience. But of course, in the main body of the work that uh, um, MA and PhD students are engaged with, mentors support and encourage movement. Um, one of the, the issues that can often be faced by those who, who are involved in distance learning is, is stagnation, is that um, paralysis of work, is being stuck by the, the blank of a white page, uh, being frozen in time, if you like. And so the mentor can help to encourage movement, to begin to break tasks down, to begin to create those strategies and structures which will enable the learner to progress in a, in a forward direction. And of course, the, the mentor can also support learners to create that sense of momentum on their journey, to help them to feel as though they're not treading water, to feel as though they're not stuck in some paralysis, but they are moving steadily forward by supporting rhythm and pace. And of course, within the reflective practice, mentors are enabling learners to really reflect on what they found easy and what they found hard. To reflect on the needs that have become apparent for them as they've been working in their areas of study. What methods have they found useful? What strategies have been helpful? What things and aspects of their learning have been missing that they may need to re-go and, and re-ground and rediscover for themselves? And of course, uh, on the completion of, of submission of work and in the final analysis, when they have their, the um, mark back for their MA or, or PhD, when they pass, of course, there is both celebration and reward. Mentors help learners to take a look back at where they've been, to look at the twists, the turns, to look at the pitfalls, the crevices, look at the areas where it was really hard and the areas where it was really easy. To accept the journey, to recognize the, um, the supremacy of the journey, and also to reward themselves for the journey. And reward is so important. As learners, we don't reward ourselves enough for the accomplishments that we make. And when we think of rewards, we're not thinking about buying ourselves a new Ferrari. We're thinking about buying ourselves or giving, gifting ourselves something which takes note. It can be something small that takes note of an achievement, that takes note of something which I have gained through um, study, through passion, and through lots and lots of hard work. 
the last part I just want to, to, to go, spend some time in, if I will, is kind of how we bring all these strands together. And I'm hoping uh, there might be uh, five or 10 minutes for questions at the end. I know we've got questions later on in the afternoon, but if there is specific questions you wanted to, uh, to offer, I hope that there will be some time to uh, bring attention to those. So if we think about that metaphor of climbing, of, of, of climbers needing the resource of the Sherpa, of learners needing the resource of mentors, how can we, we create that thriving culture? How can we develop it and sustain it going forward so that the learning uh, experience is not just pleasurable, but the learning experience changes you as well? Well, I'd like to, 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 to think about the four relational spaces that mentors and learners can co-create together. Four relational spaces which are really important for developing a thrive culture. The first is companion space. Now, if we go back to what I was saying before about the big three, uh, those issues around isolation, disconnection and introspection, Companion space is that space created with mentors and learners where a learner feels that they have someone who in part is sharing the journey with them. Like a Sherpa shares the mountaineer's journey, a mentor shares the learner's journey. It's, it's a sharing, but not uh, in the sense that there's um, an equal share of the work, but of course the work is for the learner. But it's, it's that companionship, it's that sharing in the pitfalls and the joys, sharing the experience, being there to be someone who is a listener, someone who is a guide, someone who helps in that relational traveling, the, the learner to make sense of their journey, not just in terms of that ac academic um, growth, but in terms of their holistic growth. So companion space is really, really vitally important. The second space I wanted to mention was that, that safe space. Just with the mountaineer climbing a mountain, uh, during those times of stress, um, there needs to be that place of honesty. The same is true of learners. During those times of stress where the learning journey is, is at its most difficult, mentors can create that safe, place, that safe space where there can be confidentiality where learners can speak from their heart, they can speak from their soul, they can bring their doubts, their concerns, their issues into the room without any sense of shame, without any sense of worry or concern. They can bring those things into the room, not, in, not to wire in them, but simply to hold them in a more creative way. Safe so space is so important for that. Safe so space also allows the learner to really discern who they truly are through their learning experience. Uh, often we bring our persona to bear in our learning experience. We can build our, our persona, believing that we're this person, but the journey of learning in a way sheds a light on that persona that we might get to our authentic self. One of the great things about any arduous journey is that it really does bring our authenticity to the fore. And it's really exciting for me to work with, uh, with students at every level of academia as they shake off the persona that once entrapped them and they inhabit their true authentic self and they realize that they can thrive in their authentic self. So safe space is where all this can happen at large. The third space, that relational space that mentors can help create is the challenging space. And challenge is, is really, really important. Uh, challenge can often be done through question, but challenge can always be done um, through allowing a learner to really unpack and, in a sense, deconstruct the beliefs that they hold about themselves. We all have beliefs we hold about ourselves. It's part of the story that we tell about ourselves. Sometimes we're so close to that story that we can't see the wood for the trees. And so sometimes a mentor will come in and will provide a soft challenge to those beliefs, a soft challenge which enables a learner to really bring the spotlight to the beliefs that they hold about self 
and to re-examine them, to ask questions around, are they true? Are they authentic? Do they really shape my experience? Do they really inform my story? Or are, are they um, beliefs, aspirations, expectations, which I've either created for myself or they've been created for me by other people around me? By offering that place of challenge, learners are, are, able, are enabled to really, again, um, really dig deep into their authenticity, to really hold on to um, their real sense, sense of self, their authentic sense of self. And of course, the, the third part, which is more the specialised, uh, the fourth part rather, which is more the, the specialised part, is the thera therapeutic space. And this is a space where learners are, are able to really explore their, um, their mental and emotional well-being. This is where they're really able to um, reflect in a therapeutic manner on their mental and emotional well-being to support it and to hold it better. One of the ways that we do this, of course, is through reflective practice where we can look at what's working, what's not working, what's aiding us, what's not aiding us. And we can tweak and work with those things in order to bring greater awareness into the here and now. Um, from awareness, we can bring acceptance. And sometimes there are those things that we just need to accept in a better way about ourselves. And from awareness to acceptance, we then go to adaptation where we can begin to adapt those things about us, where we can embrace those things that we once saw as limitations not as limitations at all, but as those things that simply add colour and texture and vitality to our experience of life. These four little spaces, we, we don't inhabit any one of them at any one time. We seek to inhabit all of them all the time. We try to seek to, to be in that converging point where all four spaces touch. That's the learning zone. That's the place where learning I believe happens best. There's much more I could say, um, but I just want, to, want to, to you to know that I believe that for every university, distance learning should be its jewel in the crown. Distance learning and the way in which it practices distance learning should be the jewel in its crown. Because the opportunities to um, resource, to support and enable and enhance learners from around the world is, is just so exciting. And so my hope would be is that, that universities across the board, across the world, would really uh, res uh, richly resource le distance learning to the point where there's parity between distance learning and, and campus learning, as it really seeks to invest in, in distance learners. Because you are the mountaineers, you are, you are the adventurers, you are the learners who are not only uh, growing in your own academic reputation in the studies that you're undertaking, but you are also growing the reputation of the various universities that, that you represent. Therefore, as a jewel in the crown, I hope that you feel that real sense of investment, not only uh, this year, but in all the years that you have to, to work. Well, thank you for, for listening. I wonder if there's any, any comments or any observations or feedback or questions that you might might like to offer. That was really thought provoking, provoking, and um, very powerful, very powerful ideas there of how students with mental health problems can be supported through their journey. And uh, really, yeah, really good. Thank you very much indeed. We'll take a ten minute a ten minute coffee break. Okay, welcome back, everybody. That's uh, this is uh, we're now moving on to uh, welcome Michelle Zidlovsky, a U.S. assistant professor from Beacon College, who's going to talk to us this afternoon about students doing remote field work and accommodating neurodiverse learners in remote practices. And uh, Michelle is an alumni of Exeter University, having done her master's and PhD through, the, through distance learning at Exeter and studied elephant health and welfare and elephant human relationships in Nepal. 
and as a researcher has spent numerous months or long spans of time in remote areas and these experiences coupled with experience teaching online during covid offered insights into the struggles of both learners and educators and uh, with that being said i'm fascinated to hear uh, over to michelle hi there I'm here today to chat a bit about my experiences with distance learning over the last five years, discuss how distance learning served or failed to serve both myself and my students, and examine some options for building a more inclusive campus for distance learners. Distance learners and distance educators, like researchers involved in fieldwork, often feel a sense of isolation, exclusion, and disconnection from the larger community. This presentation will focus on the challenges faced by the above groups and how educational institutions might better serve distance students. My experiences are a bit different as I am both older than traditional students and neurodiverse. These differences, coupled with my choice to switch disciplines for my MA and PhD, made my distance learning experience even more challenging. For both my master's and PhD program, I undertook months long research in a tiny Southeast Asian country of Nepal. While I was already well acquainted with Nepalese culture from previous experiences there, it was still challenging to live amongst a culture that's so vastly different than my own home country. My online support systems were vital during my field work. Lastly, I teach at a US facility for neurodiverse students and those with learning differences or autism spectrum disorder. During the initial COVID waves, I had to pivot during week six of the semester to online teaching. This remote teaching lasted over a year. My college typically avoids offering online instruction as they believe that neurodiverse students do not thrive in online settings. However, while a few students hated the rapid transition, most loved it, and I saw huge achievement level rises. First, let me offer a little bit of insight into neurodiversity and neurodiverse learners. Neurodiversity includes a long list of learning differences, such as dyslexia and dysgraphia, autism spectrum disorder, Asperger's syndrome, Tourette's, ADHD, and others. Neurodiverse students struggle even more with lecture-based teaching and need more active and experiential learning options. However, these types of learnings, learning are difficult to offer in distance programs. Women and people from disadvantaged backgrounds struggle even more. Students who are neurodiverse or have learning differences need extra support. However, what each student needs is different, just as they are with physical differences. Therefore, getting to know student needs requires extra staff, commitment by teachers to develop relationships with students, and university support systems which are easy to locate. The added stress of having a learning difference can mean that students give up or become so frustrated trying to find support services, they simply do not declare their learning difference, do not pursue extra services, and eventually stop trying to complete their education. Neurodiverse students often explain that social and educational settings feel like they are attending meetings taking place in a different language, just as they may miss much of the nonverbal communication taking place. So just as we would create a learning environment to accommodate a student who is physically different, we need to find ways to accommodate neurodiverse students. For my own part, I did not declare a specific disability. One of the reasons for this was that there was no specific support system in place for neurodiverse students while I was doing my program. That has changed a bit. There are support systems in place and the university is making an effort to more specifically support neurodiversity. While living among a culture different from your own is exciting, educational, and the highlight of many research programs, it's also very stressful and isolating. For distance students, the sense of isolation already underlies your educational process, and the added isolation of field work can be stressful. For neurodiverse students, this is made more challenging by the lack of plasticity in a lot of our daily life areas, such as food choices, clothing choices, missing one's bed, one's pets, one's office space. Therefore, it takes longer to adapt to new situations, switch tasks, such as going from a review of literature or working in an office to field work in person. And in addition, many neurodiverse people have problems with their working memory and the stress of changes or relocation further impacts this memory, meaning they need a few extra days to readjust prior to undertaking their work. Next, I want to discuss a few specific challenges that I faced during my master's and PhD programs at Exeter. I attended these programs from 2016 to 2021. There have been several important and helpful changes to PGR development at Exeter since then, as Kelly mentioned this morning. But I wanted to discuss some of the challenges my cohort faced 
many of which still exist today. There's a sense of isolation that comes from being a distance learner. And part of this arises from the inability to just drop in and establish friendships or relationships with other students, staff, or faculty members. Distance learners feel less sense of ownership of programs, campuses, and don't feel like they belong to the larger student body. And in fact, many of them have never even visited campus. In addition, making new friends may not be a skill that older students or neurodiverse students are used to practicing. When you're a distance learner, there's no organic way for events to arise spontaneously. There's no drinks after work or drinks after classes. There's no pickup games. Um, we're lacking those in-person opportunities. There's also more prejudice, teasing, and intolerance when you're based solely in a, an online format. And I think that comes from um, people's feeling that on social media or online, they don't have to watch what they say as much as they would when they are meeting someone in person. My cohort faced a few academic challenges. Um, a lot of these were based upon distance. Some of them were based upon our age. Um, initially, lag times between asking a question and getting an answer were a problem. Distance learners are uh, limited by the fact that they can't just show up at someone's office to ask questions or happen across someone going down the hallway. Typically, we can't call. We're trapped at the mercy of email, which makes us feel isolated and powerless. During my program, there was little to no university-sponsored collaboration, which I could find. There were few opportunities to find mentors and few opportunities to build community. Because I changed fields, that came with its own difficulties. I had to learn a new field, new research and writing styles while doing my program. Because I wasn't on campus, I couldn't simply audit classes or meet with people from other departments. In addition, distance learners faced a lack of access to most seminars, meetings, classes, and events. Most of these were not recorded during my tenure there. There were so many amazing topics and guest lectures offered, which we soon realized were inaccessible to us as distance learners. Lastly, older students had vastly different life experience and needs and expectations from the program. Rather than wanting to focus on getting the college experience, we wanted to jump right into discussions about our topic in our future. So finding uh, groups of like-minded and like-aged individuals was very important. As a non-traditional student, I did run into additional technical challenges during my studies. Like many older students, I hadn't used educational software programs or certain platforms before, or I had used them so long ago that the kinds I had used were outdated. I had to learn new programs for writing, for attending classes, for accessing grades, for submitting materials. This was time consuming and it was a big learning curve. In addition, there was a lack of access to some programs which I needed, such as language learning, which were just not available online. I also faced challenges from the fact that the university websites have a lot of data. This data is not easy to access and there's not really anyone who could respond quickly or easily to point me in the right direction. This got more difficult when everyone went online during COVID and no one was present on campus. Um, sorry. <laughs> I also ran into additional uh, challenges from the fact that I worked full time while during, doing my PhD. And while this is discouraged, it's a necessity for a lot of older students, especially given the cost of international tuition. So there is a need for specific support for work, working adults to encourage self-care, offer internships, uh, and to keep them from feeling isolated or from working themselves to death. In my case, it was more difficult because I, I worked, lived, and researched in three different time zones that were 12 hours apart. So sometimes I spent my entire day teaching, my early evening, studying and writing. And then during the uh, wee hours of the morning, 3, 4 a.m., I had to conduct my phone or online interviews with my participants in Nepal. So this led to a lot of exhaustion, stress, and increased mental health challenges, which continue today. There are some things that I did which really helped me feel less isolated during my um, postgraduate research. I sought out like-minded, similarly, similarly aged students. I joined Facebook groups. I saw other researchers and faculty with similar interests via websites. I joined student-led reading groups and PGR sharing groups. 
I also sought out my own mentors from outside the university, whom I asked for guidance in my field. The university has made strides in supporting similar solutions to those that we had to develop on our own. For example, there are now university-sponsored online meet and greets, such as coffee meetings. What's needed is the addition of several more of these types of programs in a variety of time zones. In addition, there are some unofficial Facebook pages for PGRs. But these pages need to be affiliated with and overseen by the university to prevent misuse. Staff or student mediators are needed for, the, for establishing and uh, monitoring these Facebook groups to prevent one student from taking over and to ensure constructive speech. In addition, updated landing pages with researcher profiles, which would be private and only accessible to students, would be great so we could seek out other people with similar interests in different departments. We also need to have a willingness to fund paid PGR positions to help plan, support, and execute these programs. There's also a need to provide mentors from within the department, external to the department, and external to the university. And then a seemingly silly but additional suggestion that I would make would be for the university to mail out some sort of a physical welcome packet because many distance learners have never been to the actual campus, which adds to our sense of isolation. We haven't had the chance to buy the t-shirt as it were. A welcome packet could include small university themed items, which might help establish a sense of belonging for distance learners. I did want to mention COVID for a moment and how COVID impacted learning at both Exeter and the undergraduate institution while I teach. At Exeter, COVID was a game changer. Suddenly, all PGRs were distance PGRs. Those of us that started as distance PGRs finally had a sense of belonging and access to everything offered at the university. Research groups, reading groups, conferences, speakers, everything went online and suddenly we had a whole new world open up to us. And I think it's really important that we continue having access to these items, which I'll discuss more in just a moment. Get my slide to switch. Uh, as I mentioned, the college where I teach did not encourage online learning for students. And as such, when COVID hit, we had no teaching platform in place and only an outdated grading and communication platform. We were forced to move to Zoom, the free version at first, so classes were limited to 45 minutes and could not be recorded. We had to use email to send assignments, do our grading, et cetera. It was a nightmare. Students had no online arena to check for further instructions and could not access their learning team, counselors, writing support center, or other services other than via phone and email. As neurodiverse students do not typically pivot quickly, the added stress of the virus and these changes meant we lost an entire six weeks of learning. We essentially started over. We went into crisis mode to support our students. And when we finally purchased an online teaching platform to use the transition to this new learning method cost our students a great deal more time. Our IT team was overwhelmed, unable to respond to issues quickly, which resulted in more lost data and more canceled classes. So the key takeaway of my experiences with both Exeter and the undergraduate college where I teach was that contingency planning is vital to student support. So what is needed to keep or improve this access that distance PGRs now have at Exeter? Well, distance learning is embraced by a lot of facilities as a good way to not only reach more students, but a less expensive alternative to brick and mortar campuses. However, this doesn't mean that they require fewer staff, even though most universities seem to operate as though they do. More staff and more faculty are needed to ensure that university suggested response times, which is within three days, are respected. Students need to be able to access a real person in real time. There needs to be enough time for faculty to get to know students personally, chances to learn about the student and not just throw them into the program, which means more faculty are needed. Learners deserve and need at least monthly meetings with supervisors, second supervisors, mentors, or other staff, which means more faculty are needed. <laughs> um, students need clearly written and easily accessible answers to their questions. The current website is overwhelming, especially for neurodiverse students. So having smaller departmental or programmatic websites would be helpful, or having dedicated PGR support people educated in where to locate information. In addition, students need opportunities to continue collaborative work. These opportunities need to be sponsored by the university rather than forcing students to seek them out on their own. 
Students also need more interdisciplinary opportunities. We need to be able to find out who's doing what research, have university-led connections with mentors, and interdisciplinary cohorts. Next, I just wanted to offer a few suggestions for working with neurodiverse students. As most higher education faculties are experts in their field, as opposed to attending teacher training, they need to be given skills that are needed to work with neurodiverse learners. Therefore, more faculty training is needed to ensure that neurodiverse students are not left to fall through the cracks. There is a need to support opportunities for students, especially neurodiverse students, to meet other students, even online. Again, making new friends is not a skill neurodiverse students often have. These skills can be facilitated via online meet and greets, collaborative assignments, and the uh, access to mentors who are themselves neurodiverse. They also need to offer very specific deadlines and access to special services that respond quickly. I know from personal experience that having dealt with faculty, guild, and student support services, occasionally months passed between the time I would email and the time I would receive a response. Staying connected during fieldwork is important for all students, but more so for neurodiverse students. So using social media platforms as methods for contact would be a really easy way to continue support of both remote researchers and neurodiverse students. But this does mean additional staff to oversee these platforms. In addition, some sort of small, specific, frequently asked questions board is needed for each incoming class. This could be on Facebook, Teams, the extra website. But it needs to be something beyond a general frequently asked questions board, which can be overwhelming to neurodiverse students. So just wanted to leave you with some key takeaways that I think are important, both for neurodiverse students, uh, distance learners, and researchers out in the field. I realize that some of these are not currently available. Limited funding is always going to be a problem, but perhaps these ideas can offer some jumping off points, which in the future extra might be able to incorporate. First of all, mentors. Offering mentors within the field and external to the college are vital. More staff to support students, more faculty, more student services are vitally needed. Information needs to be easier to locate, and there need to be a lot of opportunities for meet and greet meet and greet between distance learners. Lastly, we need to remember that all students need to have the same access and the same opportunities so that they feel like they're a part of the larger Exeter campus. Thank you for listening to my talk today. I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you.